Greater Miami is back in action after the completion of the international break, but through five games, the team still remains without a win. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio, or as you may call it, because we certainly do, Miami Total Football Radio, the number one and most listened to podcast on all things inter Miami, a podcast that, as you may have heard, has been listened to in more than 50 countries. My name is Franco Panizo. I am one third of your hosting team, but it's a uh, one half today because Steve and Primo Brenner are still MIA. We I think we lost him somewhere in the in the Bahamas or in Barbados, wherever he went on vacation, because he's still not back yet. But he will be soon. But no worries, because joining me is the other third or half this week, Jose Armando, also known as Cinco. Jose, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And I can confirm that El Primo is back in South Florida. I was working with him for the last two weeks at the Miami Open. We had a lot of fun there. Um, so I don't know where, where he's at right now. But, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. Obviously, you know, I, I think we're all waiting for a podcast in, in which we are a little bit more um, happy or optimistic about how things are going for inter miami unfortunately not the case this time maybe that is what steve is waiting for maybe that's what steve's waiting for because because obviously he's been more positive in his outlook of the team and his opinions he said this would be a playoff team so you know maybe maybe that's what he's waiting for no obviously it's a joke he's been busy i know some fans have been eagerly asking about him and for him to hear what he has to say about the state of the team, but he's been busy. He told us today he will be back soon. He will be back soon, so expect them back very, very soon. Uh, look, I, I wasn't going to share this. I wasn't going to. I thought about doing it, then I thought about not doing it. I went back and forth in my mind about it, but I'm going to. Uh, I know you guys obviously tune in to listen to things on Inter Miami, but I just want to say thank you. First off, to everyone for their support, their condolences, and their thoughts over the past week. If if you don't know, I lost my father, Jorge Alberto Panizo Muñiz, George Alberto Panizo Muñiz, over the past week, last Tuesday on March 29th. I was in Lima in the... I was attending Peru's World Cup qualifier against Paraguay in Lima, and my father passed away unexpectedly here in South Florida, and... Honestly, it's been pretty, pretty devastating for myself and my brother Bruno. If you know him, he's an Inter Miami fan. It's been pretty devastating for for us both, as well as the entire the entire family. <clears throat> Making it even worse is that our grandma, my father's mother, passed away the day before on on March twenty eighth. So our family has been going through it. But again, we thank you guys all for your support and your messages. Whether it's been you know on social media, whether it's been directly in person or, or via text or phone call, thank you so much from the bottom uh, of of our hearts and, and my heart. And uh, look, I, I wasn't going to share this, but I think it's worth sharing. Jorge Mas and Phil Neville both reached out to, to me directly to express their condolences and their support, which I thank them tremendously for. Because they didn't have to do that. They very easily could have not done that. Because obviously on this podcast, we are of the loudest critics in the local market when it comes to Inter Miami, when things don't go well for the team. And, you know, the fact that they both reached out is a sign or are signs of, of good people. So for Jorge and Phil, I thank you very, very much. Again, from the bottom of my heart for for your gesture, for your words, for your messages. Um, thank you. Uh, obviously, this show will be dedicated to my father, uh, who was, again, just to to shine a little bit more of a light on, on who he was, uh, was a 20-year U.S. Air Force veteran. He was mine and my brother's action hero growing up, our role model. He was everything I aspired to be. Uh, as a kid and certainly still to this day as an adult I will miss him very very much this this cruel part of life um, has hit for us uh, and for me um, and again I, I'm pretty pretty sad but have to keep pushing forward 
Uh, I just want to say thank you to him. And again, as well as thank you to everybody else. This show will be dedicated to him. But Jose, we've got a lot to touch on. So let's get into it because I know you're under a time constraint. And we're going to touch on several things here. So that includes Inter-Miami's 3-1 loss to the Houston Dynamo. We're going to have a guest on to preview this weekend's game against the New England Revolution. We'll also touch on the World Cup draw, as well as Gonzalo Higuain's recent retirement talk, or the talk of Gonzalo Higuain retiring. So we will do all of that and much more in between over these next two segments. So, Jose, let's get to it. Okay, Jose, so Inter-Miami returned from the international break with a home game against the Houston Dynamo that was delayed due to lightning in the area in Fort Lauderdale by almost exactly two hours, a two-hour weather delay that actually allowed you to make it to the stadium, but we'll we'll touch on that in a second. (laughs) Um, Inter-Miami loses this game 3-1. to All the goals came in the second half. Former Fort Lauderdale striker Fafa Picot scored a brace. Goals in the 57th and 93rd minutes. Uh, and uh, Darwin Quintero scored in the 49th. He opened the scoring for the Houston Dynamo. The long goal for Inter Miami came from the penalty spot from Gonzalo Higuain in the 66th minute. So still no lead for Inter Miami in 2022. They still have yet to have a lead in a single game. But again, we'll touch on the attacking woes in a little bit. Uh, Jose, just to start, what was your biggest takeaway from this loss? Oh, and before you give me that, I forgot to lay out the formation. Inter-Miami came out in a 4-3-3. Nick Marsman was in goal, making his first appearance of the season. Your defense from right to left were DeAndre Yedlin, Damian Lowe, Christopher McVeigh, and Noah Allen. Your midfield three were Gene Mota, Gregory, and Robert Taylor. And up top, you had... Ariel Lasseter, Gonzalo Higuain as the nine, and Robbie Robinson with his first start of the year on the left flank. So that was Inter Miami starting group. Jose, what were your biggest takeaways, or what was the biggest takeaway that you took from this game? Uh, well, listen, I think, I don't know if there's one thing that we can point at. Um, I mean, there's some progress, I guess, when, when you look at the stats in terms of shots and that's something that Phil talked about in 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 the post match press conference, but you know a few weeks ago, um, I was I had the idea that, and I mentioned it on the podcast that I felt like Phil was in control because of the way he he was able to switch formations. He did it within a game in halftime, um, and he has been switching formations so. Um, I, I thought he was in control, and I remember you not opposing to that, but you know you were just not sure about it. Um, now that a few weeks have gone by, I'm concerned that um, players are not believing right now, and um, I think that's that's my takeaway. And I I I've been thinking about this, and and um, I wonder if. You know, if if we were if we're thinking differently, if I'm thinking differently, if Inter Miami scores two early goals over the weekend, then you have a different outcome. But as of right now, it makes me feel like the players are not buying into this. And maybe why? Why? why, why like what? What did you see on Saturday that made you think that? I don't know. I I feel like you know that the team never responds. Right when they go down, I don't feel like there's there's that sense of urgency, and they, and it should be for this team. Phil Neville did say that they after the game that the team is a bit fragile right now, given the the circumstance because they haven't won, and um, you know when they go down, it it does it is a bit of a blow. So the team is fragile. That's the word you use, fragile in that way. So that has happened. I mean, like for a year and five games right now. I I, I just. I, they never come back. They don't have this team. You know, when when you drop a game, um, like the one they did in Austin, um, like the ones they did last year against um, New England, 
I, I don't see that response from the team. I don't see that sense of urgency. And um, I, 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 it's it's really hard to tell when you're not there every single day dr during training. But I'm I'm just concerned about that part of the game. You know, I I want to see the players a little bit more into what what Phil is trying to do. But if they don't believe in it, then it's going to be really hard. So for me, the biggest takeaway, although I do think that's very notable, um, not only what happened on the field, but, you know, Phil Neville after the game saying that the team is, is in a fragile state right now. Uh, for me, the biggest takeaway is, and maybe this is not a surprise to anyone, but this team just isn't very good. It's just not very good. And, you know, we can criticize Phil Neville's tactics. I surely have. But... The team's just not very good. Because even in that first half, when they played well, they still couldn't find the back of the net. And, you know, yes, they needed more chances in the penalty area because they took 22 shots. Five were on target over the course of the 90 minutes. But not many were very clear-cut opportunities that tested the goalkeeper, right? So uh, the Dynamo goalkeeper, Steve Clark. So, yes, you could point to, to Phil Neville's tactics and you could criticize it again surely but the team also has the players also have to do their part and players didn't put shots on target from some half decent looks that they should that you'd expect them to put on target I, I recall one from Robert Taylor in the first half where they set him up at the top of the 18 and he pushes it wide with his right foot I mean you have to put that one on frame you know I mean Phil Neville can't go out there and shoot that and take that shot so you know the, the players also haven't performed well enough and again look look in the second half the game is scoreless and then some defensive mistakes lead to a goal it's 1-0 okay you can go down in a game that's that's perfectly normal but then Inter Miami shoots itself in the foot with a self-inflicted wound it was just it was just a mistake from Nick Marsman and Damian Lowe miscommunication he, Nick Marsman comes out to, to get the ball Damian Lowe doesn't move out of the way in time Marsman spills it he tries to recover it and that leads to a penalty kick that makes it 2-0 so this team just isn't very good overall and we we kind of said that in or we did say that we didn't kind of say it we said that or at least I said that in in preseason that I wasn't convinced by this roster. That it could be hungrier, it could be younger, it could be more athletic, it could be more together. But that it's just still not full of much talent. Franco, not but they showed, they showed a lot more in the first. You remember the first game? They had, they at least they had energy. I mean, they they it's okay if you know if you don't have enough talent. But they, but they didn't. To me, they didn't look bad, Jose, in the first half. And I, I know when we sat there in the press box, you sat next to me. You weren't very pleased with the first half. At least you were you were muttering some things there, and you were shaking your head. I, don't, I wasn't really sure what you were saying, but it didn't sound like you were too pleased with the first half. After the first eleven minutes, I didn't I didn't mind the first half. After the first eleven minutes, there's no there's no intensity. And and, and look to your point. You know, Phil has tried different formations. Phil has tried different formations. I think he's this. found the one he's going to go with for a bit, though. I think this is the one. Well, if this is the one, fine. But, you know, this is why I'm thinking the players are not buying into it. Because you try different formations and you have the same outcome. You know? So, um, listen, I, I will go back to one, one thing that, you know, we, we have talked about a lot in the pod. And it's Iwain. The positioning for him, that's very important. That's he, very important. He played as a nine this time, though. He played as a nine. We said on the last yes. pod two weeks ago. He dropped a lot. He, he dropped back a lot. But he you was know, there, but he was more of a nine this time. More of a nine. And you can see that You can see that in the numbers. You can see that in the numbers. He had the least amount of touches of the field players. And that's because he's now he was serving as more as the nine. He was waiting for the ball to come to him. Yes, he dropped at times, but he was more of the spear of the attack or the spearhead of the attack. He was more of a traditional number nine in this one. Although, yes, I acknowledge and admit that he did drop. But we asked to see him more in the box. And in this game, we saw him more in the box than we had seen in recent games, in my analysis. No, I mean, physically presence inside the box is one thing. With the ball is another thing, which is, of course, you want to have him with the ball or at least have opportunities. But how many times did Robbie Robinson push through the left and P.P. Tewain was not inside the box, or at least did not get the ball. Because then again, Robinson, you know, he's a good 1v1 player, but 
it's just not working right now. I I mean, it's the first game for him, so I'm I'm not gonna go all out on on him. He didn't like your question post game, huh? And he did not like your your question. He was like, ah, I don't know what you're talking about. He didn't like my question, but that's the reality. I'm sure after watching video, he's gonna realize that's. I mean, he went all night long on one B one battles and did exactly the same thing over and over and over again. It, it was hard to watch from the press box. Let's be honest about hey, it. Hey, look, listen, since the first game I saw Robbie Robinson in, I have not been fully sold on him as a as a player in MLS. I will be honest about that, as I always am. But in this game, I like what he brought to the team. In this game, I like what he added because he helped penetrate into that final third a bit more than we've seen from this team. And they looked more threatening in that first cool. half. In large part because of him. In large part because of the way he went down the left, took on players one on one. Yes, his 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 moves and his movements are predictable because he tends to cut back on that right foot. Something I touched on last year that he doesn't really use his left too much. He tried to on one play, but regardless, it was it's not like it was an incredible performance from Robbie Robinson, but it was a welcome performance in my opinion because it added something that the attack was missing. So. Look, if they can build on that first half, if they can, you know, this was his first start. This was the first time in the in the four three three in the regular season, if I'm not mistaken. So I think if they can build on the first half going forward, maybe we see this team improve. Maybe we see a ball find the back of the net. Maybe we see uh, better chances created and better chances taken because this is the first game again that I believe that they played in the four four three three. Sorry, my mind's a bit everywhere right now so it's not my memory's not as sharp as it as I normally like to have it. But I still I still remember when you were talking about playoffs during the preseason. I si- no. remember and I told Jose. you take your time. Take Jose. your time. This I, is not gonna Jose, be over we predicted we predicted together. With no, with El Primo about- because that is where the that is because that's where the bar is. That's where the bar is, and that's where the team has said the, the bar is for them. That's where they will measure their season. That's where they will define their season and whether it was successful or not. Is whether they make the playoffs or not. It's not about. We both agreed in our preseason predictions or in our season predictions that they won't make the playoffs. That we don't think they're going to make the playoffs. Steven Primo Brenner did. He think he said sixth place, and we both said tenth or ninth, something along those lines. So. I don't think they're making the playoffs. I brought up the subject and said playoffs is their is their bar because that's what they have said. And that's where they will measure themselves. They're not talking about a championship now, but they they have and they will measure themselves to the playoff as a standard. They, so that that's where I was coming from with that. I don't think this team's a playoff team. I don't. The way it's constructed today and the way things are looking, I mean, I just don't don't see a playoff team here. But Jose, is going back to the performance. Was it a good performance, a bad performance, or somewhere in between? Uh, I don't think that that was good. I don't think that was good. I mean, you can look at stats and tell me so many things about it, but from what I saw, I don't think it, it was good. I don't think you're going to win games like that. You know, because, I mean, if, if you play one good half, that's... That means nothing if in the second half the other team destroys you and you start, uh, you have no energy and you have mistakes in the back. I mean, you can score very easily two goals early and then get scored on in the second half three times and that's it. And then you're going to be thinking about the first half and, you know, that's a moral victory and all that. But no, I don't think that's, that's, it was good enough. I don't think it was good enough. And especially, you know, when you're playing at home. When you have a rain delay, you see the amount of, of, of fans that stayed and watched. I think you need to have a sense of responsibility of people staying late and, and watching the game. So, um, no, I don't think that was good. It was better, but I agree with you that it was not good enough. And it wasn't good. Because even in the first half when Inter-Miami looked okay, it looked pretty decent. The first half... On the on the on, in balance, on a, on balance on on a scale, I would say is acceptable. I would say is acceptable because they did create chances. They looked like the aggressor, the protagonist. They looked more threatening. But but 
That came after an 11, first 11 minutes in which they gave up three very good looks that the Dynamo did not put away. So, you know, Inter-Miami, Phil Neville, Damian Lowe, yesterday at practice, they've talked about we had 22 shots and we were we were the more dangerous team. Damian Lowe even said that he thought the Inter-Miami was the better team. But the Dynamo no. had three very clear-cut opportunities in that in those first 11 minutes. Nick Marsman came up with two big saves including one in the 44th second of the match to, to keep it level. And then Fafa Pico put an open header, an open header from around seven yards out over the crossbar. So if you want to look at Inter Miami and say, yes, they could have scored some chances in that first half, well, then you also have to look at those first three chances that the Dynamo had and said, and say, well, they could have also scored those chances. So on level terms in that first half, I think it's it's a it was a fair, fair first half, first 45 minutes, but I, again, Inter-Miami's performance in those opening 45 minutes for me were acceptable. The performance was acceptable. Now, in the second half, didn't see much of the same from Inter-Miami. This time, they gave up an early goal four minutes into the second half, and they didn't really muster the same type of, of energy and still didn't muster the same type of... Uh, threatening play that we saw in the first half. Yes, they get a goal off of a penalty kick for, and Gonzalo Higuain scores it for his second of the season, but just didn't see the same type of, of level of play and performance level in that second half. So I agree yep. that the, the, the outlook is still it still isn't great, but that's why I think if Phil Neville is working on anything this week, he's looking at that first half and he's showing them film of that first half and trying to get them to, to build on that. Yes, they'll probably try to correct their mistakes from the second half, but I think, you know, they'll harp on the on the on the first half, try to try to build on the positives that the team showed. Because there were some positives. I know you you're you're not too sold, but I do think there were some positives in those opening 45, 45 minutes. I like the formation. I, that's where I was going next. Jose, the system, the four three three. Is this the look you think Phil Neville will go with for the for the next few games or for the short-term future because we touched on it on a couple weeks ago and we did plan to have a pod last week to preview the Houston Dynamo game but obviously uh, circumstance did not allow for that to happen but anyway uh, you know a couple weeks ago we said and I and I said I thought the 4-4-2 was was done and dusted for the time being I thought that the Phil Neville would change it he did he goes to the 4-3-3 is this the look that we see going forward from Inter Miami yeah, I think, you know, this is I, – I like the formation. I like the formation as long as we stay away from the five-man back line. I think, you know, things things will get better. I mean, you have to score, right? You have scored, what, three goals and two penalties? Right. You, you have One goal score. from the run of play, which is concerning. Yeah, it's very concerning. So um, I think you keep the formation. Um, I still think they need um, – uh, they need a player. They need to bring in a player whenever it's possible, whenever that is possible, um, because I think the the team is uh, struggling with the build up, and um, y- you need to have um, Pipita inside the box again. I mean, I keep saying that, but I I feel like that's that's the way to go. He needs to score more goals for this team, and not from the penalty spot. Um, and, and the only way that he's going to score if if it hits inside the box with the four three three formation, you know. Um, there were with, times with where Robert... he was in the box, though. There were times where he was in the box and he didn't get the ball, and I think that also impacts his confidence levels and and his belief in the team. There was that one play yeah. in the first half where Robbie Robinson decides to to take it on himself as opposed to pass to Higuain, and the shot gets deflected out for a, for a corner kick, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that plays like that impact his his psyche and 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 his way of uh, of delivering on the field and in terms of being in the box and whatnot. Because I, again, I he did not he did not get a lot of touches in this game. Finished with the least amount for an Inter Miami field starting field player. So uh, yeah, that, that was exactly my point, right? Because I was about to mention you know players like Robert Taylor, um, another player that that's prone to one v one. Um, not, a, I mean, maybe it's, it's time, you know, he needs more time, but as of right now, I don't see a connection between Robert Taylor and any uh, of his teammates. Um, I just don't see it. Like I saw it early between Ari Lassiter and, and Pipita, 
I, I saw that early on. I don't see it right now with Robert Taylor. And then John Mota and, and Gregory, if you're asking um, from them to be good defensively, to recover the ball and then to work in the buildup, you're asking a lot from them. So I think they need to find that connection between they need they still need to find that Fede Wayne. So you, you want know? you want a ten. You want a number ten. Words. Fede they need to find a Fede Wayne. A player that Pipita uh will feel comfortable with and that he would trust enough in the middle so that he can stay at the top. I think that's the player that they are missing right now. Okay, so for as far as the formation goes, I, I will repeat that I think this is this is the look. And I think just to summarize or to, to state it quickly, it's because it plays players to their strengths. Or it's the formation that has most closely played players to their strengths. You have, you know, the midfield three. You don't have Gene Mota out now on the right wing playing a right midfielder in a 4-4-2. You know, he's he's more central, playing to his strengths. You have fullbacks that, that aren't tasked with being wingbacks and having to cover a whole lot of space. So, uh, so now you just have a right back and a left back, so that plays to their strengths. You have Gonzalo Higuain as the 9 slash false 9, uh, but it plays more to his strengths, even though he didn't get much of the ball in this game. And then you have two wingers, which this team has speed and it has players that fit that profile. So again, for me, the 4-3-3, one of the reasons why it looked better than what we've seen in, in recent games is because it just played players to their strengths as opposed to trying to you know, shoehorn pieces in different spots. So I think this, I think this is the look we'll see for a bit. Yeah, I think that's the look for the team, for the players that are available right now. But if you are able to get that number ten, you know, I think it'd be interesting to to see a four two three one. I, I would like to see that. It's possible. You know, with with Mota and Gregory uh, in the middle, and just give Adi or Taylor um, a shot on the wing. I don't know if you want to keep Robbie. I wouldn't, but I mean, it's it is what it is. Then you get that number 10 in the middle and then Gonzalo inside the box. So I, I think that they'll be ideal, but, you know, what, what what's the market like right now for, for Inter Miami? I think they're going to need to bring players in. I mean, that, well, they that definitely, was... They have a DP slot available, so, you know, they're looking for that for the summer, it appears. So, you know, it's definitely something they can explore. And I, I imagine that they, they it's something that they have in the back of their minds that they will try to address. I, I don't think they're just holding on to that just to hold on to it. I think that they will try to address it this summer. Don't know with who. You know, the big names keep keep popping up here and there, but we'll see what, 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 strategy, what strategy they take with that. Jose, a couple more things I want to touch on. <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple th- more things I want to touch on here. One is the lack of goals. You touched on that. Three goals in five matches, two off of penalty kicks, only one from open play. To me, that's a very alarming stat. It's a very concerning stat. What is the problem for the team in that regard? How do they fix it? The floor is yours. Well, you know, they, they did create some chances in the, in the game against Houston. I can remember a couple of shots from Lasseter that went, that went over the bar. Uh, maybe those, those shots, if they come from a striker or a pure nine, they should go on frame. But I think we have thought we have touched on this on this before. When you put responsibilities to score on players that are not used to scoring consistently, then you know you're going to have missed opportunities within the game. So that shouldn't be a surprise. That Robbie Robinson, that at last they haven't been able to score. That's not a surprise. Now, who's the goal scorer for this team historically? Who's the goal scorer for this team? The one player that scores consistently throughout his career. That's Gonzalo Iwain. That's Gonzalo Iwain. So you need to find a way, if you're Phil, you need to find a way to give the ball to Gonzalo Iwain in spots in which he can score. That's the name of the game right now. That can fix a lot of things. You know, Gonzalo Iwain, he might be old and he might be a lot slower than his teammates, but he can score, you know? He can. He's not going to be able to outrun Ari Lassiter. But if you give an opportunity, ten chances for Ari Lassiter inside the box, he's going to miss seven. Gonzalo Wayne will probably score on seven of the ten chances. That's the way it is. He is a goal scorer. Give him the ball inside the box. Find a way to do that. Lead him to believe that he needs to be there. Trust the system. And if he's able to do that, then I think problems would get solved for Inter Miami. They might not win games. They might not win games because 
you know, scoring is not the only thing that you need to do to win games. But they will be a lot better and and they will be fun to watch at least if they have a chance to score. Because as of right now, listen, to people that go to the stadium, I think, you know, we see the comments. It's not a lot of fun to watch Inter Miami right now. And we heard the frustration from the fans afterwards with the boos at the final whistle. And after the final whistle, fans clearly are, are, are frustrated with the lack of results and the overall performances. So something that, that Inter Miami needs to try to address as soon as possible. As as for the attack, look, I, I agree with you that having Higuain more in, in the box would be a plus. But I think the problem comes more into the belief that the team has in itself. Because... I touched on that play earlier where Robbie Robinson took the ball on his own instead of passing it to Iguain. And in my analysis, the reason why Robbie Robinson did that is because on the previous play, Inter Miami does a good job of moving the ball and progressing it forward, and they move it from right to left. And Robbie Robinson's wide open in the penalty area on the left side. Robert Taylor could have slipped him through, but Robert Taylor instead decides to take a shot and, and doesn't pass it to Robbie Robinson. So I think on the next play, where Robbie Robinson found himself penetrating on the on the dribbling run, he was like, well, I didn't get it last time, so I'm taking this one on my own, as opposed to maybe doing the smart play and passing it to Higuain, who was, who was slipping in there on goal. So I think it's just a belief and, and, a, and a, you know, making the right play situation. Like It's kind of like a chicken or egg situation, right? Like, you need Gonzalo in the box, but in order for him to get in the box, he needs the ball. So other players have to feed him. Otherwise, he starts to drop back. But then if he drops back, how do you feed him in the box, etc.? So it's it's a conundrum. But but I think if, if they can figure a way out to start gelling a bit better on the field and making the right plays, maybe the, the overall vibe of losing is, is forcing poor decisions to be taken. But if they can find that, if they can find the composure, the word that Phil Neville has used, if they can find that composure and they can make the right play a bit more often, then I think maybe that helps resolve the the scoring woes that we've seen through five games into the season. But again, like you said, maybe that doesn't solve everything because when Inter Miami opens itself up in this way to try to be a bit more attacking, they leave themselves exposed defensively, and the defense has shown not to be good enough to, to really limit chances. Again, Dynamo created three pretty good ones in the opening 11 minutes. They just did not put them away, which is... Goes back to my point of why I don't think this is just overall a very good team. Quickly, Jose, we have a couple, we have a few more things to touch on. I know you have to, you have to run soon. So, uh, you have something to add there? Yeah, that you know, let's not forget that the team has a problem at left back, right? With well, we're going to touch on that. We're going to touch on that. He's, okay. We're almost All there. Right. We're almost there. Uh, Nick Marsman was back in goal. He got his first start with Inter Miami this season, a week after starting for Inter Miami CF2. So he's back from injury. Quickly, Jose, how do you think he did? Well, you know, it's going to take some time for him to get back into the rhythm of play, but, you know, big mistake, costly mistake. It's the second goal. If, you know, the mistake is not there, we have a 1 1 game. Uh,. Yeah, I don't think that's it's good enough for him. If, if you're not ready, if you still need one more game or two more games with Inter Miami to go right ahead, but, but you know, as of right now, it looks like it was not the right decision to bring him in. It, it looks, it looked to me like with the ball, you know, he was pretty much almost back to his his usual self. Maybe not a hundred percent, but close. Uh, but the decision making. With the, with the teammates, with the new back line, that, that doesn't seem to be there yet, obviously, as you can see from the mistake on the on the goal with Damian Lowe, where they didn't communicate properly. So, is it too early to bring him back in? I think the situation called for it, I think. And I think that's part of why I don't think this is a very good team, is because certain decisions are being made because of the losses piling up. And because of the lack of depth and the injuries, and there's just a lot of things that have gone wrong for this team during these first few months of the season, or or the year with preseason included. So uh, there, there's a lot of flaws, there's a lot of faults, and a lot of issues with the roster, and that's that's coming to to show its head. It's also been a, quite a bit of injuries, which is why Nick Marsman 
was probably put into the position to start this soon because Inter Miami's down to its number three goalkeeper if Marsman isn't ready because Clement Diop it has been has been nursing a knock. So uh, you know it's 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 not a uh, I it's not it's not ideal, but it's the decision Inter Miami went with, and obviously it, it did not pan out perfectly. So touching on the injuries because I don't I, oh I didn't even answer the question. I don't think he fared poorly because he made two great saves in the first half, he made two great saves to keep the game level, but then he makes a mistake, and when you're a goalkeeper, you can't make those mistakes. You're just, you know, it's costly. It's costly, and it proved to cost Inter Miami and put them, put them in a hole. It was a self-inflicted wound and an individual error there, or you could count it as a multiple player error there with with Damian Lowe. So uh, obviously, he came back to bite Inter Miami, and uh, he, clearly he's he still needs some work with that back line to to gain that chemistry and get that get that down pat. So. A mixed performance for Nick Marsman, in my in my opinion. As for the injuries, Kieran Gibbs and Breck Shea last week were announced to be had to have hamstring injuries, and they will be out for, well, in Shea's case, a good amount of time, several weeks, and for Gibbs, it's a week to week basis. So I saw Kieran Gibbs doing some drills at the end of practice on Tuesday, so he's clearly closer. Brett Shea seems to be a bit a ways away because he was nowhere to be found yesterday as far as we could see during the parts of training that were open to us on the, on the media side. Jose, are you concerned by the hamstring injuries? Are you concerned by the injuries overall that are just piling up for Inter-Miami and have been piling up since preseason? Um, no, not really. Not really. I'm not concerned about that. I'm, I'm just concerned about, you know, just having Noah Allen as a left back. That's my concern right there. I think, you know... Um, ha- hamstring injuries are are common, and um, I-, I don't know if maybe the weather in South Florida. It- it's 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 something to um, that that's a factor into this. Um, I'm I'm not concerned about that, honestly. I'm just concerned about having Noah Allen as a left back, which again I think is a, a promising player. Um, to me, he's not a left back. I mean, he needs to play higher on the pitch, but. Right now he's a left back and and I don't think it's working. I I kept telling you on 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 Saturday night that you know Houston they needed to switch um, Fafa to the to Noah's Noah's out inside because I mean he he's just an, an overpowering player and he will move easily move past uh, Noah Allen. That's exactly what he did at, 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 to score the, the the third goal, his second of the game. So I think that's something that. Other teams are going to be looking into, you know, attacking Noah Allen a little bit more. So um, we'll see if, you know, we see an adjustment from Phil. I don't know what the options are. But there, that's, uh, so that, that goes back to my point of there being a lot of issues with the overall team and roster. Because I agree with you, and I think we said this on the last podcast when we when we had the segment on the Noah Allen interview. And if you did not hear that, make sure to check it out because we had a. I had an interview with Noah Allen, and he touched on a, du- a number of different things. But we, I think we both agreed that we don't think he's ready for the MLS level to be starting regularly on the MLS level just yet. He's still 17, so that's understandable. But he's starting games because of injuries to the first choice left backs or the left backs that are ahead of him on the depth chart, and that is, and those are. Breck Shea, Kieran Gibbs, and Jovan Jones. All three are recovering from injuries. And all three are older players, veteran players. So True. it's it's like Inter Miami in general as a whole isn't to me my opinion isn't in isn't in a great place. They've they've signed older players that aren't holding up. They're signing other players that aren't performing. It's just it's just not 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 a great state right now. So it's not completely unex. Let's just say that it, it's not completely um, unexpected that um, Kieran Gibbs, Brick Shea, and Jovin Jones are injured. Well, Jovin because- Jones's injury came off of just you know a, a f- you know some some a freak p- moment, a freak play uh, last year, and, and he suffered an an, a, an a ligament injury. Right, but that has happened. Not the ligament injury, but you know those are players that. Well, Gibbs and Shea is At like least Shea right. Gibbs and Shea have have been injured quite a bit over their time with Inter Miami. And estamos jugando con el periódico del lunes, right? You look at the new, at Monday's newspaper, and you can it's you know it's hindsight's twenty twenty. But 
You know, that those are concerns when you sign veteran players. Are they going to be able to hold up? Especially if they've been showing some some injury issues before their arrival. So, uh, you know, it was like Ryan Shawcross, for example. I don't think many people were surprised when, you know, he lost most of last season with an injury after coming off of two years without playing all that much because of health reasons. So, there's, there's look, it's not Noah Allen's fault that he's not ready. He's 17 years old. He's just not ready for the MLS level. But he's being put in the position and thrown out there because there's nobody else. There's nobody else right now. So it's 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 a tough situation overall for, for Inter Miami there, but obviously maybe they could have made better decisions with regards to to that left back spot. But that's just one one small sign. Quickly touching on other injuries, Victor Ulloa and Clement Diop were both seen at practice on Tuesday. Uyo, we haven't seen for a couple of months since he suffered an injury in preseason in that game against, I believe it was Columbus, the first game of the of the of the Carolina Challenge Cup. I was surprised to see Clement Diop in goal doing drills with the other goalkeepers because Inter Miami had announced that he'd be out, I believe, six to eight weeks, and that was only a couple weeks ago. But he's already back in training, at least from what we could see during the first 15 minutes or so of, of practice on Tuesday. So looks like he's getting closer to a full recovery sooner rather than later. I also saw Ryan Saylor doing some drills afterwards. And and, and uh, I was going to say Jermaine Jones. Jovin Jones has done some team practice, has done, has done some team drills. I don't know if he's ready for for 100% action or resum- resumption of action, but he's getting close as well. Last thing I want to touch on on this segment, Jose, with you is Gonzalo Higuain's retirement talk. His dad said on an Argentine TV show on Monday that Gonzalo Higuain had told him that he, uh, that he planned to retire at the end of the season. Gonzalo Higuain on Tuesday to us here in South Florida told us that there was a misunderstanding there that he has not communicated that, that when he does communicate it, he'll be the first one to tell everybody publicly. Let's listen to what Gonzalo Higuain said. It's in Spanish, so if you don't speak Spanish, you don't understand Spanish, I just quickly summarized it for you, but let's listen to what he said. No, fue un malentendido que tuvo él para conmigo. Yo en ningún momento le dije el retiro. Eh, se expresó mal. Eh, Bueno, puede pasar, pero nada tiene que ver con la realidad. Eh, yo estoy enfocado en el club, en cumplir el contrato y llegado el momento, si se llega a tomar esa decisión, voy a ser yo el que la comunique. Eh, nada más que yo, lo que puedan decir. En este caso mi papá o otras personas eh, no tiene nada que ver con lo, con lo que puedo decir yo. Así que llegado el momento, seré yo el primero en comunicarlo, el primero en decirlo. Pero ahora mismo tengo la cabeza en este club y en cumplir el contrato. ¿Es algo que pasa por la mente Gonzalo Higuaín? Obviamente está haciendo No, está cerca de dejar de jugar, pero no es lo que tengo ahora en mi cabeza. En mi cabeza tengo, como te digo, cumplir lo que me queda de contrato y a fin de año se verá cómo me siento. Me sentaré con el club y veremos qué es la mejor decisión. Pero mi decisión es, es enfocarme en hacer una gran temporada este año. Ahora bien. Bien, así que nada, quería aclarar esto para que no haya más malo entendido. Llegado el momento, seré yo el primero en comunicarlo. Jose, what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts? To close out this segment, what do you think about the overall state? Do you believe Gonzalo Higuaín? Do you believe Jorge Higuaín? What do you think there? Well, I'm sure that there has been a conversation about it between the two of them. Uh, maybe, you know, Gonzalo was not pleased by the way, you know, things were handled in terms of, um, you know, the information getting out there uh, and not being the, um, him the one that, that that would do a press conference or that have an interview or that announce that, um, that he'll be retiring. I think there are conversations, of course. Um, things are not going well right now for, for Gonzalo, and I think it's good for him to come out and and talk about it and and you know the time will come for him to make that announcement and and I don't think it's right now that conversation is not helpful to the team and um um I know some fans have been joking about it and they were <laughs> happy about the news but 
you know, I think Inter Miami needs Gonzalo Higuain as much as, you know, you hate him when he gets mad on the field or or he doesn't seem to be into it. I think the team needs him to score, needs him to be a starter, needs him to be the leader that he uh, promised that he would be early on in the season. And so um, I, I think it's good that he came out and, and clarified things. But, you know, conversation is there, I'm sure. And, and you know, maybe around December, November, we're going to have, we're going to confirm that uh, these reports are true. I, I do believe that, you know, it's, it could be time for him to retire, but as of right now, it's good for him to stay focused on the team. So I will say that I, what I think, and I think Gonzalo Higuain did tell his dad he plans to retire. I think his dad just had a slip of the tongue on national TV uh, in Argentina, and that made the rounds internationally, and Gonzalo Higuain probably was like, all right, damage control here. I have to come out and say that that – that that's not the not the case. That's just my my interpretation, my my opinion, because I don't really see a way that your dad can can say, oh well, Gonzalo told me he's going to retire, and that just be a misunderstanding. I just don't don't fully understand how that could happen. And and look, full full transparency here. When I had to sit down with Gonzalo Higuain at the during preseason before the season started. One of my last questions to him after the after I showed off the camera was, uh, you know, like when you retire, what do you plan to do? Uh, do you plan to stay in soccer? Do you plan to stay in football? And he was he said he said no. He does not plan to stay in the sport. Wants to to be removed from the sport. And I asked him then like, oh, are you going to go back to Argentina? Do you plan to stay here? And he's like, no, I'm staying here. I'm staying here in South Florida. So look, that I, that's why I asked him, and and you could hear it there in that in that soundbite. I asked him, you know, if the thought is crossing through his head, at least of retirement. And he says, look, it's close to happening, right? He's at an advanced stage in his career, but it's it's closer to happening than not. However, I don't think he's going to publicly acknowledge it until maybe later on in the year, maybe in like a Federico Higuain style, who, by the way, had his jersey, well, not his jersey, but who had a, a retirement ceremony with the Columbus crew this past weekend, which was very nice. If you haven't seen the images, check them out on, on social media, on Twitter, Columbus Crew's Twitter handle has a has several photos of that, but anyway, I think Gonzalo Higuain is likely to retire at the end of the year. My opinion, not information. I think it's it's very possible, very probable. He's in the final year of his contract. There is a team option for twenty twenty three on Inter Miami's behalf, but I just you know I don't see them taking that up. So I, I think he will likely retire at the end of twenty twenty two. But anyway, we've talked a bunch here in this first segment. Let's take a break. We'll come back in preview. This weekend's game against New, the New England Revolution with Frank Delapa, a longtime friend and a close follower of the Revolution. So we'll take a break and we'll do that after this. Motivation is to deliver for them because I think we've got the best fans and and that's that's what that's what hurts us. It hurts me immensely when when I hear you know when I hear them at the end disappointed. I feel that we deserve that because I, I I'm disappointed, but I feel their pain because they deserve more. They deserve more and they deserve better. And, and we have to deliver that to them. That That's non-negotiable. Okay, guys, it's that time of the week again here on Miami Total Football Radio where we talk about the next game, which takes place on Saturday afternoon at 3 p.m. at Drive Pink Stadium in Fort Lauderdale. Inter-Miami welcomes the New England Revolution to town. And joining us this week to preview the game is a Boston Globe reporter and an MLS slash soccer slash football OG. His name is Frank DeLapa. Frank, we go way, way back. So before I ask you how you're doing, I'm going to give you some stick because Italy did not make the World Cup yet again. Yeah, okay. They, they, I guess they deserve not to make it. So what can you say? Uh, <laughs> I went back in the research. Italy's only lost like 11, I think, qualifiers in the history of World Cup qualifying, but they've been losing. They used to win when it counts. Now they lose when it counts. Yeah, but how, how are you? How's everything? Italy okay. aside, because obviously you're of Italian descent, which is why I make the joke and take the little jab. But Frank, how are you, uh, all things considered? Yeah, all good. All good. Thanks a lot. Good, Franco. Good. Glad to hear that because obviously we go way back. You know, there was a time where you were living in South Florida. Now you're back up in in the frigid Northeast. Is the weather cold over there? Is it getting warmer? Are you thawing out? How's it going? 
Yeah, everybody's like, I saw guys wearing shorts and stuff because the temperature got into the 40s and stuff like that. So, <laughs> so it's pretty good, but, you know, it's not, not not like down there. So I think, you know, Revolution will be looking to, forward to, you know, getting into some warm weather yeah, this no, weekend. Yeah, it's like, I know you I know you know it because you've lived here. It's like when here it gets below 70 or 60, <laughs> people start whipping, whipping out the winter boots or the or the big uh, the big jackets. So uh, it's it's funny in that way how, how uh, polar opposite things are but anyway let's let's focus on the game the new england revolution come to south florida what can inter miami fans expect from this revolution team a revolution team that has not gotten off to the greatest of starts in mls play in 2022 well that's a good question because i think the revolution is uh you know i think they're kind of ready to start clicking Mm -hmm. but they're going to be missing guys like adam buxo who's uh you know suspended uh uh, with a red card last game and, you know, uh, Gustavo Bo is, is, uh, is questionable. So uh, I think they're, they're kind of ready to get going, but they've been victimized by this really tough early schedule, which includes right. champions and the bad weather and all that stuff. And uh, so things have piled up. Whereas last year uh, things went for them. This, this, the, this year, a lot of things are going against them. Yeah. Now I was going to ask you that because obviously if you've been around MLS for a long time, you know, that teams that compete in the CONCACAF Champions League at the start of his MLS season, normally they tend to struggle in regular season play because they have so much focus on the international tournament. They have to, you know, balance lineups, minutes. You know, they don't want to over over uh, overdo it with some of the players in terms of the, the, the their, their workload. So how much of this of these early season struggles do you just pin down to, the, to that scheduling, to having to compete in the Champions League? Because... It's not like the team is is off to a terrible, terrible start. It's one win, one draw, and three losses. Six goals scored, nine goals against. So uh, how much do you put it on, on having to balance that out for Bruce Arena and the team? Yeah, I think this is more like this is sort of par for the course for, for New England Revolution early in the season. Even if they're not in the Champions League, they struggle. Most of the games are away from home. They're not able to train outside. You know, there's a lot of things go against them. So the revolution always gets off to a slow start. Okay, last year was a huge exception. I never thought I'd see that in 26 or 27 years, whatever, where they would get off to a great start and win the supporters' shield. Uh, That was that's a one-off. Okay, this is more like it, really. So throw in the terrible weather that we've had, uh, an early start to the schedule earlier than ever, plus Champions League games. And it's piled up in the revolution, and then they're they just have, don't have the depth to deal with it, and things have gone against them. Yeah. Now, what kind of game should Inter Miami fans expect from the revolution? Like, what what type of style do you think Bruce Arena will have this team, this revolution team, play? Will they look to hit on the counter? Will they look to boss possession? Obviously, it's still a very talented team, the Supporter Shield winners of of twenty twenty one. So um, there's still a lot of talent on in that in that team. So what can we? What do you think we can expect from? the New England Revolution on Saturday afternoon. Well, one thing about Bruce Arena, he's he's come here and just put in a, a high-octane offense all the way, plays with two strikers, you know, outside backs, everybody bombs forward. And uh, that's why they one reason why they led the league in scoring last year, uh, home and away. So I would expect them to come down there and do the same thing, uh, go through Carly's heel and just play forward. So, uh, you know, he, Bruce might at some point say, let's kind of, you know, be a little judicious as far as advancing out of the back and kind of, you know, keep it, keep it a little tight because you've also got one of the keys to what the revolution success last year was Matt Turner in goal. Right. Uh, he hasn't played a game yet. Uh, they've gone most of the time with a third string goalkeeper, Earl Edwards Jr., who did a pretty good job, but he's still number three. So when you're uh, playing all out attack, leaving your uh, defense exposed and you got your number three goalkeeper back there, uh, you know, you're playing with fire. So I think Bruce Arena has been uh, willing to try that anyway. Uh, Brad Knighton filled in well last week, but, uh, you know, it's it's a high wire act. And I think, but you could expect that again, I think. Yeah, and Bruce, and Bruce Arena's as savvy an MLS coach as there is in this league because he's been around for so long and he's been so successful uh, in major league soccer. As a matter of fact, last year when the New England Revolution came to town, they handed Inter-Miami a trying to make sure I get this correct. It was either a 5-0 to zero or 5-1 to one loss. might have been 5-0. Uh, it was Inter-Miami's biggest defeat of the year, and that was a real rock-bottom point for the team. It actually kind of helped turn the tide for the team because then after that they went, they changed some things and went on a, went on a bit of a, of a run. Now, as for the revolution, obviously 
Anyone who was paying attention to MLS last year knows the key men, knows the key players. But let's say there are some people that are new and are following the team for the first time or following the league for the first time this year. Who are the danger men? Who are the key players that Inter-Miami fans should keep an eye on or that Inter-Miami itself needs to try to keep under wraps in order to improve their chances of winning? Yeah, well, the first first guy that everybody looks at is Carlos Hill, who was MVP of the league last year. Uh, you know, he's also probably right up there as far as drawing the most fouls in a game. And so that's what Miami's going to do, I'm sure, is just pay attention to him, maybe foul him. And also I think Carlos Hill might be the, the guy in the league, maybe Carlos Vela, who gets fouled the most, but it doesn't get called. I mean, people are all over him. You really have to take away his left foot. And uh, that that's the key to the offense right there. When Adam Books is in the game, uh, there's your target man. And they play off well with uh, Gustavo Bo. But again, you know, the Revolution might not have their forwards in this game. Uh, Josie Altador will be kind of coming home there. So uh, if he's healthy, uh, that's the other guy to watch. If he ever starts clicking with all these guys, then Revolution will be dangerous again. But again, it starts basically starts and ends with Carly's heel. But also watch those outside backs coming up. Dewan Jones, very dangerous uh, on the left. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, Sebastian Legette. U.S. national team is kind of clicking with the team. If he has a starts breaking out, then there's another guy to watch closely. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask you about Josie Altador. He's a South Florida guy. Obviously, was was raised here for a part of his life. New addition to the New England Revolution this this season. Obviously, he's at the tail end of his career, more so than at the beginning of of his career. Uh, how has he been? How has he performed over these first few games? Obviously, has the U.S. men's national team experience. Uh, he's played abroad. Uh, maybe not the most fan favorite in the in the American fan base, but you know how has he played so far in these first few games? Yeah, Josie's been fine. Uh, I don't think they want Josie to be going ninety minutes though, and uh, mm-hmm. you know I think they wanted to ease him in. And uh, but with the the crowded. Uh, schedule um you know suspensions injuries he's had to play you know a lot and last game he came out at uh halftime with uh you know they're saying like a nagging injury we're not sure how bad that was so i think that's working against josie uh the fact that if he could ease his way in look the revolution had two strikers last year buksa and Bo, who you know were really dependable you don't really need a third guy Bruce Arena thought that he could spot Josie in and, you know, really give him an option off the bench. Um, to have to depend on Josie now, I think, early in the season is probably not what, what they planned. But, yeah, Josie, I mean, look, you'd rather have the guy on your team than, than against you, in my opinion. I've seen him with the Red Bulls in Toronto playing against the Revolution. He's a handful, right? He's a handful. And he still is. Yeah, so so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's a homecoming for Josie. Warm weather, playing on grass. You know, if there's any chance he can go 70 minutes or 90, you know, I'm sure that's that's the plan. Yeah, I'm sure if he's healthy enough to play, he will have family in attendance, family and friends, uh, and of course, you know, he'll be he'll be motivated in that in that way. Frank, what is the key to the game for the Revolution? What do you what do you think the Revolution have to do, uh, or what will they try to look to do? in order to try to at least get a result, if not a victory, at DraftKings Stadium on Saturday afternoon. Well, again, you know, get Carly's heel involved. And also, look, the Revolution believes that a good, the best defense is a good offense. You know, they, if they can bomb forward and, you know, just put the pressure on Miami, not, not really a high press. It's just basically everybody goes forward. You think in terms of we're attacking all the time. And that'll put... Total football. Well, well, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of. Yeah, it's like you're just thinking, you know, we're going forward. Yeah, it's sort of that. It is that. It's, it's pretty direct. Uh, but with Carly's heel as a heel as a, uh, you know, a number ten that can just make everything happen. So I think that's that's the key. If he can get in the groove and you know, um, you know, everybody's going forward, it works out. They don't get caught too too often in the back. Uh, you know, Miami counterattacking, you know, then I think that's the key. I think that's what they're looking for. So we can expect the revolution to try to dictate the tempo and have, have the ball. They're going to try to do that. So that's what you would imagine. Yeah, the uh, revolution will act like they're the home team, basically. Okay. okay. <laughs> forward, it's, it's a really kind of counterintuitive, but it's, it works I for mean, them. listen, it's not a terrible game plan, especially against the Inter-Miami, the state that Inter-Miami is in right now. It hasn't hasn't been convincing all that much. And, I, and I'm and i going to finish on this note with you because, again, you've lived in South Florida and you have seen MLS evolve from before 
it was even uh, an official league until until what it is now. What do you think has gone wrong from for Inter Miami from the outside, from your perspective, from your seat, from your analysis? What do you think? Where do you think the missteps have been, or what do you think needs to needs to be corrected for for this franchise to get on track and be the franchise that a lot of people think it can be? Because there is a lot of potential, obviously, down here in South Florida. No, it's huge potential in, in South Florida. Look, when the Miami Fusion was going, they didn't have huge crowds, but I was always impressed. This was back twenty some years ago, right? Yeah. It, the, the sophistication. The knowledge of the fans, they knew what they were watching and they weren't going to buy anything that wasn't, uh, you know, high level, first rate. And I think that's sort of working, uh, can work for um, mm-hmm. Inter Miami now and against them because I think they were on the right track. They had Diego Alonso, who's going to the World Cup with Uruguay right now. I thought they were kind of moving in that direction. I thought they maybe should just kind of stay in that direction. I'm not sure what the identity of the team is now. Right. So, but again, I think you've got a, a demanding fan base down there and you've got to really, uh, uh, you know, meet that. And, and it's not easy, but I, I think that the potential is, is through the roof. You know, whether whether that stadium's in Fort Lauderdale where it is now or Miami, uh, you know, you've got great fans down there. So, uh, you know, but again, you've got to meet meet their expectations. Absolutely. And that's... Yeah, this, this, this past weekend, we heard boos at the final whistle because fans are not happy with this winless start. And we'll see if things improve on Saturday or if we hear more of those boo birds after the game against the New England Revolution. Frank, thank you so much for your time. We actually have a little challenge for you that was set up uh, on the last podcast because because this podcast is called Miami Total Football Radio. But I also, since it's uh, we're in South Florida, I also call it Miami Total Football Radio. We roll the R's here as well. I'm going to ask you to try to say it in Spanish, if you can do it. I think you can do it. I, I have faith in you. Miami Football Radio. There we go. There we go. See, you didn't roll the R, but you you got you got the pronunciation. You got the pronunciation down pat. By the way, before I let you go, how's how's Bruce treating you? How's Bruce treating the media? I know throughout his career in MLS, he's always been uh, he likes to give his little jab here and there. So how how has he been? Is he has he calmed down now, or is he still the same, or has he gone even more full throttle now that he's older? No, Bruce is basically exactly the same as he was. But I'll tell you, he's, if you if he gets going, he can give you tons of information. Not too many filters there. We got found out a lot about Matt Turner's injury, which was a big mystery all along, and nobody was really letting on. Uh, he kind of get the lowdown on that last week. So you know, if Bruce wants to tell, you know, he's 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 still a really good source. Yeah, awesome. Well, Frank, thank you again for the time. We really appreciate you coming on. A lot of insight there with regards to Saturday's opponent, the New England Revolution for Inter Miami. Frank, where can people follow your work if they want to? Obviously at the Boston Globe, but on Twitter and any other social media platforms you want to plug. Yeah, basically just Twitter, Frank Delapid, just my name. And, you know, in the Globe, so bostonglobe.com. And that's at Frank, F-R-A-N-K, Delapa, and that is with two L's, D-E-L-L-A-P-A. An MLS veteran, an original, before an original. He's been around for a long, long time. Frank, thank you again for the time. We will talk to you again very, very soon. guys so before we finish out the show with our beloved q a session jose let's talk about the world cup draw it's a world cup year i think we'd be remiss not to talk about the world cup over the course of 2022 so let's just quickly go over the draw that happened last friday group a has host qatar ecuador senegal and the netherlands group b consists of england iran the united states and a European playoff team to be determined, which is between Scotland, Wales, and Ukraine. Group C is Argentina, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Poland. Group D, the one I'm keeping my eye on, is France, the international playoff, which will be between either Peru, Australia, or the United uh, Arab Emirates, excuse me, United Arab Emirates, Denmark, and Tunisia. Group E, Spain, the international playoff between Costa Rica and New Zealand, Germany and Japan. Group F, 
Belgium, Canada, Morocco, Croatia, Group G, Brazil, Serbia, Switzerland, Cameroon, and Group H, Portugal, Ghana, Uruguay, and Korea Republic. Jose, your quick thoughts on the draw. Well, I'm going to start with the CONCACAF teams, um, just because this is technically our region. Um, I think, you know, all of them are in trouble. I think the U.S. is probably the team, the national team, with with a chance, slim chance of making it to the second round, making past the the group slim stage. Slim chance? Yes. Really? Yes. Yes, unless Scotland gets the the final spot. Dude, I, th- uh, I think the U.S. has a good chance of, of making it out of that group. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say slim chance. I think they have a great. No, good chance. I would say slim chance. I, I just I mean, listen. I think that's a favorable I, draw. I, the, I think that's a good I draw. I know for there's them. potential. I know there's potential within the team, but you know when you go to the World Cup, it's it's another level. It's another level, and I don't think Greg Berhalter is a, a good enough coach to to take this team far. At that level, I think defensively, when you're forced to play defense, then you're going to struggle. If 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 it's all about scoring goals, then of course the U.S. has a chance because they they do have a lot of quality. But when you have to play defense, that's when they struggle. Um, I think, listen, the Ticos Costa Rica, I I I think you know they they sh- they are they're done. I mean, even if they end up playing the World Cup, I mean, you get the excitement and all. Right, they have to get but, to New Zealand first. Yeah, if if they do that, I mean. Uh, I don't know. Spain, I don't Germany, and Japan's a tough, tough ass. <laughs> it's very tough. It's very tough. And then Mexico, I think you know, it's it's uh, the it, it, that matchup against Poland. That's that's a key match for them. Yep. But I don't see them winning that game. Um, and who else? Canada. Oh, Canada. Well, you know, Canada is about playing for the first time in a while. So you know, this is the first step for them. Twenty twenty six will be more realistic in terms of what you want, uh, what what you can. Um, expect from them right now just to get um, Alfonso Davis and you know Kyle Aaron and all the young players on, on the World Cup for the first time I think that's that's all they're looking for in terms of the of the group stage I don't I don't see them moving on to the next round and if you want you can take Conmebol so I, well, I, I touched on it a little bit because because of uh, the Mexico group of course Argentina is there they should take that group so I think the US has a very good chance of getting it out of the group B that's just my opinion, my analysis. I think it's a favorable draw for them. I mean, that's as pro- probably about as good as you could almost expect if you're a U.S. fan or if you're the U.S. national team. Maybe playing Qatar, obviously, in Group A, maybe that would have been better. But for the U.S., I think that's a that's a solid, solid draw. And I would expect them to get out of that group as the second-place team. And I think, I think with the talent that the U.S. has, that... Each of those games are winnable games. Now, people might be like, oh, well, England is, is is very good, and they are, but the matchup helps the U.S. in, in that in that way, or the, the matchup is more favorable for the U.S. because of the style that they play. If it was the U.S. in France's group or Argentina's group in terms of playing the, the, the top seed or Brazil... So you're I, saying the U.S. can win that group? They could, right? They could. I'm saying no, I'm, no. No, they could. I'm not saying they will. No oh, hold on. See, there's a difference between. No wait, way. there's a different no way, Jose. Way. Jose, because then you're gonna say in in November that I said this. <laughs> there's a difference between could and will. I think the U.S. could win each of those three games. Will they? I don't know, and I would probably say probably not. Now, or I would say probably not. Now, I agree. I share your concerns, and obviously. The U.S. didn't have the most amazing qualifying campaign. And I think coaching... They qualified by goal differential. Let me correct. remind you that. So I think by because of coaching and Greg Berhalter, also a young head coach on the international stage, I think that that is the challenge that they will face. Will, will he be able to manage the games, the group stage games, in the best way? Similar to how we've said, you know, Phil Neville's a young head coach here at the club level. Greg Berhalter is a young head coach on the international level, and there are questions about him, not just from you and I here talking about this for the first time on Miami Total Football Radio, but just in general speaking, generally speaking from fans and from um, national media here in the United States, there are questions about Greg Berhalter. So I, but I do think the U.S. has the talent to make it out of that group and to, to, if, to potentially if win. If they have the they... ball. If they have the ball. You're thinking... 
You're very. That's very. They don't very need the positive listen. Thing. Counter attack. Thinking, counter attacking with Gio Reyna. They're gonna possession. No, no, they're no, gonna no, create no. I, I don't think the U.S. Will have, no. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what the U.S. U.S. is all about. If the U.S. Right? has possession, so, you know, then they won't be playing well because that's when not, you that's go not the to US's that game. level. It's different. Right? But that's not the U.S. Listen, the U.S.'s strength historically, and I would say even till now, as a national team, is the speed and athleticism and and counterattacking and now with the with the, this generation of players one on one ability and, and finding space Christian Pulisic Gio Reyna they're 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 a possession based team in CONCACAF because of the level of the opponents or they can be but at a higher level they're not going to be a possession based team but just I don't if see that with the team that they have. then they have to be good defensively right they have to and be good historically and historically that's what they historically that's what they've been. Now, in this qualifying cycle, maybe not, but historically, they've been better uh, on the defensive side, relying on good goalkeeping, some set pieces, and some counterattacking. And I think that's what we will see from the U.S. in in the World Cup for, for large, large stretches. But anyway, uh, I, I said I keep, I'm keeping an eye on Group D. That's because that's the group that Peru could fall in and hopefully will if they take care of business in June against, again, either Australia or the United Arab Emirates. Quickly to wrap up the, the the World Cup draw because we could talk about it, we could talk about it for for probably an, an hour. We could dedicate a whole show to it. Maybe we will later on in the year once we know all the teams. By the way, I hate the fact that they did the draw without knowing each team that was in there because the draw would have been different. Peru actually would have fallen into Group A had had they already qualified. But I get that they have to sort out logistics and, and all that. But anyway, Jose, is there a group of death? If there is, which one? Yeah, I think you know the um, Japan, Germany, and um, who's the other team? Spain. I forgot. Spain and, and Costa Spain, Rica. I think. Yeah, I think that. No, well, Costa we're assuming, Rica. We're assuming Costa Rica. Yes, um, that that would be the group of that for me. Okay. Um, I, other than that, I, I I just, I mean, they're even in a sense. They are pretty like these, even. Yeah, one or two teams that you know. They should be. We have. We we should have a good group stage. I, I should say that. You know, it should be exciting. Um, I think. I think it went well for me. Of course, Honduras is not in the World Cup this year, so I'll be enjoying every single match. Um, and um, yeah, but I think that's the group of death. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to be in that group. I, I mean, I'd rather be in the World Cup. But if you want to be in that group, and you know, your chances are very are very slim. So I think I agree. I mean, I agree with you that the draw itself is pretty balanced across all eight groups right i don't think there's a clear-cut group of death if i had to pick one if you twisted my arm and said there has to be a group of death because we need to have that talking point during a world cup i would probably say group h portugal ghana uruguay and korea republic is there a clear favorite in that group i mean diego alonso is in there with with uruguay so no i'm just kidding but is there is there a clear-cut favorite i don't know i don't think so Portugal didn't didn't wasn't overly convincing in their qualifying campaign. Uruguay got in there late thanks to the introduction of Diego Alonso and some good results down down the stretch. Korea Republic is a is a perennial World Cup attendee and and they they have had some decent performances, gotten some recent decent results over over the years. And Ghana, of course, is also uh, has historically been pretty decent. In in the World yeah. Cup, so I think I think for me Group H is the group of death. Uh, obviously, of course, for me Group D. Group D is the one I'm keeping an eye on. I've said that this is the third time I think I'm saying it, but it's it's almost the exact same group that Peru had at the 2018 World Cup. Almost the exact same group if Peru makes it, because in 2018 Peru had France, Denmark, and Australia. Now Peru might have to go through Australia to get to Group D if that's what the the playoff entails. So it could be a very, very similar path for Peru. And if they do make it, if they do make it, the crucial game will once again be against Denmark, as it was four years ago. They lost that game 1-0, a game that they thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly uh, played well in. They created a lot of chances, just couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. Christian Cueva also missed a penalty kick when the game was 0-0 near the end of the first half. I remember it clearly because I was in the stadium in Saransk, in Russia, watching it, and uh, you know, Peru, Peru had every opportunity, and and from every facet, long distance, short distance, penalty kick, free kick, crosses, shots in the box, every type of thing you could think of, and the ball just would not go into the back of the net. So that will be the key for Peru to qualify if they do make it to the World Cup and to get out of that group to avoid a repeat of 2018. 
again, if they make it, it's beating Denmark. Because you don't expect them to beat France. I would expect them to beat Tunisia. That makes it the, the make-or-break game against Denmark. So we'll see if Christian Cueva, who's playing incredibly right now uh, at a very high level, we'll see if he can get his revenge and if Peru can make it out of the group stage should they reach uh, the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Now, all right, Jose, enough for the World Cup draw, although I'm sure we will revisit it later on in the year, especially with Primo. We have to hear his uh, his insight and opinions and analysis with regards to England's chances. But let's get to the Q&A session. So no no talk about the mascot, right? Do you like the mascot? I, I like the mascot. <laughs> I like the mascot. You know, there's there's a, a, that, that's a, that's a whole new topic when it comes to the mascot and... Um, the relationship that uh, has been created by Boca Juniors fans with uh, River Plate. I've been having so much fun about, uh, with that. I, I like I like the mascot. I approve, by the way. Did, did I miss something? I mean, I, I like. Did I normally? Oh, I normally. Oh, come on, no way. I, I, listen, you did. Listen, listen, and and I, I don't want to get sad here, but uh, you know, my earliest soccer memories are watching the World Cup with my father, '94. Um, I remember when the U.S. beat Colombia, we jumped in the pool in his house in, in Kendall, I believe we were in. I was like I was four or five years old. Uh, we jumped in the pool with my brother after after that win. And then in 98, from 98 on, I remember the mascots very, very well. And the mascots, I've always liked the mascots. I've never not liked the mascot. So I like the mascot. I don't know what I missed, though. <laughs> well, let me point one more thing. You mentioned Kendall the Hood, according to A-Rod, right? Okay. Let's let's leave baseball to the side. Uh, you missed that one too, I guess. Um, have you seen the mascot? Yes. Have you seen it? Yes. He's a he's a little. He's got. It looks. It's like the the white. I'm gonna say the wrong thing here. It's like the white headwear that they have. The headpiece that they wear. Correct. Yeah, Guitars. but it, it looks like a ghost as well. Don't you think? It could look like a ghost. Like I could get. I could see that. It could look like Casper. Okay. Do you remember River Plate going to um, getting relegated? Yes. And what happened in the stands when Boca Juniors fans faced River? You don't remember that? What happened? They had. I like remember there little... being turmoil. I don't. I don't remember much. They else. had a ghost in the stands, and the ghost was looking just like the mascot with a B in the middle, in the heart, I should say. You don't remember that? I'm blanking on that. I'm bl- I remember there being turmoil and, and just, anger. Just I will go Google it. I will Google media. it. Yeah. Just go to social media and type um, what mascot River Plate World Cup, and you will have okay. a lot of fun with it. I will see after. the memes. I will see the memes. Okay, Jose, <laughs> let's quickly get to the Q and A session because we've got quite a few. Probably won't get to every single one, but let's try to hit as many as possible. And let's try to do so quickly. Let's try to make the answers succinct. First one, let's go with Anthony Armolato. Who's had the better season so far, Gregory or Mo Mo Adams, and why? Jose. I think Mo Adams. Mo Adams is 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 having a a good a good season. I was surprised that he was not starting. You know, I think Phyllis Scott, in between, you know, having the good player that's performing at a high level and having not a franchise player, but you know, a big name, the captain. So you have you're in the middle whether you want to decide do you put the guy that's doing things really well and live out one of your captains, you know I think he's in between making that that decision, um, but I think overall Mo Adams is is playing at a high level. I agree, it's been Mo Adams. He hasn't played in every game, but when he has played, he's done his job. Whereas Gregory, he hasn't lived up to the standard that we expect him to. Uh, at least so far through the first five games. So I would say Mo Adams. Well, obviously, Gre- Gregory has the has the potential to to be more of an influential figure, but he has not he has not delivered as as has or as the team has failed to do as well. So uh, next question, and it comes from Jorge Medina. Next transfer window. What kind of players slash positions does the team need to acquire? Jose, I believe, said they need a number ten. Is that yes. earlier in the show? I agree that they could use a number 10. I think they could also use, if right, we don't know the, the salary cap situation, like the exact numbers, but if they could fit it, I think they could use a a winger. A winger, a more productive, more consistent winger out there 
either on the right or on the left. Uh, again, not probably not a big name, but someone they that's consistent. wingers though. But do they have do they have Winger. starting caliber wingers? Yeah, the, yeah. Well, this again, it's Inter Miami. It's Inter Miami. So don't expect big names or. But that's what I said know. not a big name. I said you know you could go and get an MLS starter somewhere. You might have to trade some some pretty good coin or, just, or something, you, but. Or just give the players that you have a chance. I think that's. that's I think that's a nod to Emerson. Not, I think that's a nod that's to Emerson. Not right big there. Problem. I think you're nodding yes. to Emerson Rodriguez. I think that's what you're trying to get. At. Uh, just give him a chance. You know, he he was playing first division football in Colombia. That's that's. That's good. I mean, it's not great or the best. It's not the Premier League, but if you give a chance to Campana, then I think he deserves a chance as well. Just saying here. I don't. I don't know if he's. But I don't know if he's a regular ready to be a regular starter in MLS, regardless of if he can show more than what the guys that have shown so far. I just don't know if he's ready to be a regular starter from what I've seen. From what I've seen. I don't know that you can get anything better. Better in the market as well. I mean, it's Inter Miami. Can, Nobody's going to want to come can here. Find, you can find a player in MLS like that's a it's a regular winger somewhere, and I mean, you'd have to trade something, and that's that's the question with the team trade. Maybe not, but I mean, they need a. I think that if again, the question is what positions. I think number ten, and I think a winger, maybe possibly uh, a better a, left a, back. a better. I would say a better center. No, they don't need another left back. They have four on the roster. Four. Three well, are injured, yeah. but they have four. They have four. I don't think they need a yes. fifth. I don't think they need a fifth. Uh, but you, know, you can trade Break Shea if anybody wants him. Jovin Jones, you can trade him as well. Karen Gibbs, I mean, he needs to recover and prove that he can be there for the team consistently. If not, then you need a left back. I mean, you have four in the roster, but only one is available. But that won't you be forever. That won't be forever. You'll at some point there's going to you know. Yeah, but going for to get how out. long? When Karen Gibbs comes back. For how long is it going to be available and then go out injured again? Which is what happened just a few weeks ago. Remember? Right. We, we kept on waiting for Gibbs to play. He was finally ready to go, and then I think it was two weeks later, and now he's not available again. Right. 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 I just yeah, I just can't see I can't see you building a roster of I just can't see it. Inter Miami on a roster of thirty players maximum going with five left backs on it. Like I just I can't see that. I don't th- and I don't well, think that would be some of them. Are. Right, well, you'd have to move other parts, but do something about it. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I was trying to be simple with the with the question, but okay, I, I get your point. <laughs> now, all right, next qu- <laughs> next question. Well, we'll do two. We'll join them together, and it comes from one's from Dos Nose. And the other one is from Elder Bar. Dos Nos says, how many losses will it take for Phil Neville to be replaced? Is there even a number or his, is his seat always going to be guaranteed? Elder Bar asks, and I think it's the second week in a row he's asked this, for Phil's lawyer, or second show in a row, for Phil's lawyer, does he still blame the shackles of Pizarro or is Phil just not a fit for Inter Miami for all would it have been better for Gonzalo Higuain to leave? Do you think the climate is just not good for 90 minutes of pro football? What do you miss? Oh, who do you miss from those that left? Animo Franco. Thank you, Older Bar. I appreciate that. also appreciate the message from Roberto Rivadeneira, who didn't ask a question, but he commented in the Q&A session, Fuerza Hermano. So thank you, Roberto, and thank you, Elder Bar. Uh, Jose, is there a guarantee? Is, is Phil Seed always guaranteed, or is there is there a number that you think could spell doom for him obviously we get this question or a type of this question quite often yes well you know I, i've mentioned before that i think if he's not able to win at least one of the first 10 games that should be it and um if should if be he, but is is that would that be it is the question is is there a number <laughs> is there a number mm. I've said no, and I will reiterate no while you think there. I don't think that there's a number. I mean, maybe if they lose 20 games out of the – or 19 out of the first 20 games. 20 games? Maybe then. May, I just don't – again, I've said it over and over again. I just don't see David No, but Beckham. I think, you know, that's – if I to me, it's about winning. So – if you're not able to win one of the first 10 games, it's not about losing games because, you know, um, there are so many excuses out there. The rain, 
we got an early red card, uh, a penalty. There's so many excuses. But for you to win, how many games are you going to be able to win early on? Ske- That's the why schedule's I, not looking I, too favorable, though. It's not looking good, and even and now, and now even Charlotte, which is for me the 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 one shot that they that they had early on at winning. Now Charlotte is looking a lot better, so it's situation is complicated for for Inter Miami. So again, I think you know first ten games, if you don't win a game, that should be it, and you know the Open Cup situation as well. If you don't move past the second round. I think, well, it's, that would be the third round, actually, of the tournament. First game for Inter-Miami. I think that could be trouble as well. That could be a lot of trouble for, for Phil. I think that's something that, you know, Inter-Miami cannot allow um, to have, whether it's uh, Miami United or Miami FC, win that game. I think that's, that's, that's bad even for the branding. And I think that could be a tipping point. So I will answer those those questions a little more directly. How many losses will it take? Maybe twenty. Maybe uh, is there even a number? I don't know. I, I don't think so. From the outside, I don't think so. I think I don't know if he's always going to have his seat guaranteed. That's a long time. But I think for this season, I th- I think he's here for for the longer haul. I think he's here through this year. I think this is they're looking at this as a rebuilding project. And I think that they're going to stick with him. And again, I just don't see. Even if Jorge Mas wanted to let to you know make that decision, or you know Chris Henderson wanted to make that decision, I don't know if David Beckham signs off on it. So I've said that before, and I'm just reiterating it again because we do get that question uh, quite a bit. As for Elder Bar, Elder Bar's questions was it would you would it have been better for Gonzalo to leave? I mean, look, he's not retiring yet. If he retires, I think it'll come at the end of the season. So you're you're, you're with him now. For better or for worse. And if you took him off the team, maybe that would have a positive impact on the locker room. Maybe to an extent uh, on the field. But, you know, you're also losing the little bit of attacking quality that you do have. I mean, it's a conundrum. It's a, I think you, I think someone, I don't know if it was you, Jose, referred to it as una crisis, a crisis that Inter-Miami is in right now. So, you know, anyway. As for who do we miss that le- that left, I would say... I think Leandro Gonzalez Pires is someone that's missed, and I know maybe some some listeners are probably like, "What? No way!" He got criticized a lot for his temperament and his yellow cards and his missing games, but he was a solid defender, generally speaking. Yes, he picked up a lot of cards, but he he was solid, a solid defender, and he contributed to the attack. Something I said on one of the postseason pods after the twenty twenty one campaign. Not having him. Not only takes away from the defense, it takes away from the attack because he was one of the weapons. He, he His passing out of the back was one of the weapons Inter Miami had to create. He either got assists or helped set things up with his ability to pick out a, a long ball either on the ground or in the air. And that happened multiple times in 2021. So losing him hurts the attack as well. And as you can see, Inter Miami right now is starved of goals. All right, let's go last one. Last one. There's two good ones here. One's from Don Cavacito, one's from Lucho Dalo, but let's just go to the last one because we're, we're, running, we're running late here. We're running long here. And he says, I firmly believe brujeria done by Paul McDonough when he <laughs> left because of some of the things that happened are un- unexplainable. Do you think this club needs a limpieza de huevo? <laughs> Jose. Um... Not yet. Not yet. I'm not sold on the idea. Um, I believe they need a 10 and they need people inside the box. That <laughs> you're, la- you're, la- you're laughing a lot over there, bro. This is, the fir- this is one of the first times I've laughed in a, in a good bit. <laughs> yes. That was a lot of fun. That was a fun question. But yeah, no. Not yet. Not yet. Let's, let's just give... Um, well, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's going to happen, but I want to give the team a chance to actually have Pepita played inside the box consistently. And if that doesn't work, then yes, I don't know who who do we have to talk about that. Um, who's who's yeah. doing the limpieza? Who's doing yeah, the limpieza? I don't know. That, that, that's what I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, let's just you know give them. Uh, one more chance, I, I would say. Although, well, you know, 
on over the weekend I, my expectations are very low very low very low on the on on this team just because um 3 p.m game against uh, a team that is good but is struggling i don't know my expectations are very low on that game but no no limpieza just yet i'm not really i don't really believe in curses and hexes and things of that nature i i just personally don't believe in in those things but Inter Miami does feel a bit snake bitten, right? Like just when certain things seem to be going well, something happens and it just it just brings the team down again, or or just something something negative seems to happen. It doesn't seem like the team can ever really get momentum going, whether it's on the field or whether it's you know things off the field for the franchise in general. It just always seems to there's something in the way. So while I don't believe in it, is it time for a limpieza de huevo? Yes, I think I think it couldn't hurt at this point. <laughs> so I would say yes. But let's leave it there for the Q and A session. We had some other ones. Maybe we'll we'll bring them on next week. Uh, we'll, we'll carry them over into next week if they're still they're still fitting, including Lucho Lalos. But anyway, that does it for the Q and A session. Jose, I know you're tight on time. Final thought. I'll give mine, and we'll wrap up the show. Um, well, my final thought is on uh, on the Open Cup. You know, I've I've been enjoying some of the games. Um, I just, I'm happy that the tournament is back. Hopefully, you know, when the time comes and, and Inter Miami plays, fans are able to go to the stadium. It's a different tournament, a different vibe. You know, it's a win or go home type of situation. Um, maybe the one chance that Inter Miami will have this year to play a, a game like that. So, you know, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So hopefully we have a good matchup as well, whether it's Miami United or Miami FC. You know, trying to create some rivalries, although I think those two teams already have a sort of a Magic City Classico. Uh, they played in 2018. They have played before. So, you know, it's all good. It's all good and a lot of fun. In, and, you know, the beauty of the Open Cup is that, you know, you only have to play at a high level or a good enough level for 90 minutes and anything can happen. So that's my favorite tournament so my final thought is on the u.s open cup continue to enjoy by the way all the games are available online on espn so you know it's it's a lot of fun to watch espn plus espn plus, plus yes. yes espn plus okay uh, my final thought will be on how i started the show and that is dad I can't even do it. I can't even do it. <laughs> Thank you. I will miss you. I already miss you dearly. But thank you for opening the path for me and my brother. Okay, okay. Um, for bringing us here to this point, came from Peru with my mom at a young age, raised us here in the States, served in the military, bounced around the world to help provide a good life for us. And I thank you. I cherish the memories we had. And I will, ch I will cherish them until my last day. Um, I look back fondly on our memories. You were always a good dad. Always a good dad. Um, I can only express my gratitude to you, and I hope we made you proud, especially me. I hope, as your oldest son, that we made you proud. But anyway, um, <coughs> that does it for this week's show. Sorry to end on a sad note, but I just wanted to do that. Um, no, we love you, and we love you, and Thank just you, you know that everybody, you know, is rooting for you, for your family. Um, you know, obviously these are tough times, but you know, I actually want to thank you for sharing this moment. You know, it's it's I'm very happy to be here in the pod right next to you, and just know that you know um, our friendship will be there forever, and I'm sure everybody listening is feeling the pain right now and is sending well wishes to you and to your family. Now, these are tough times. Nobody wants to go through something like this. But we know for a fact that you're that. It will be forever, you know, proud of what, what you're doing and, and everything that's coming for you, for you guys. So, 
Um, a big hug. Uh, I'll give you one the next time I see you. Another one. Um, Thank you. You're, you're a great guy. And 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 listen, things things will get better. You know, he he'll help you from above, and he he will always be watching and follow you guys along. So stay strong, my man. Stay strong. Thank you. And, and te amo, papa. Te amo. Uh, y te extraño. Okay, that does it for this week's show. And sorry for getting emotional there. My dad definitely wouldn't have liked that. He's a military guy and, and always taught me to be tough and strong. That's what he would want from me. So I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to compose myself. But that does it for this week's show. We will be back again next week to review the game against the New England Revolution and preview what else is to come for Inter Miami. Hopefully a more positive a more positive show with a potential result from the team with at, maybe at least a better performance. If not a result, at least a better performance. So we'll see how things go. For Jose Armando, I am Franco Pizzo. This is my Total Football Radio. And we'll talk to you guys again very soon. Days when I could live my life without you Days go by and still I think of you Days when I could live my life without you Without you Without you